When the Republican Party won back control of the House at the 2022 midterm elections, they claimed they would tackle the looming threat of China. Whether that be through further investment in military, disabling TikTok or implementing more tariffs, the GOP considers the CCP as an enemy and a top priority to harness if they were to win the 2024 presidential election in November. That's not to say that the Democratic Party don't feel the same, but the emphasis on who will prioritise the threat of China the most is a campaign promise on both sides of the political aisle. What the two countries do have in common is their commitment to building the best military in the world. While the United States has prioritised its defence capabilities since its creation, for the last few decades, China has been busy building and modernising its own military. So the question begs, who has the most impressive military, the United States or China? Now, if you do like this sort of content, please like and subscribe to our Talk TV YouTube page. Joining me now to compare the United States' military to China's is former British Colonel Hamish de Breton Gordon. Hamish, thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure. Hamish, plain and simple, who has the most impressive military, do you think? Well, this is not a straightforward question, I suppose, or answer, as you can imagine. Uh, still, by far and away, the United States ha has the biggest, largest and most capable military, air, navy, uh, subsurface, space uh, and, and army force. But when we look at military capability, it's not about all about numbers, although numbers, quantity does have a quality all of its own. It's about training, you know, how well trained are your people? It's about the equipment itself, how, how advanced is it? You know, how, how basic is it? How, can it can it override all the electronic warfare that your enemy will throw against you? What are your logistics like? It's no good if you've got thousands of tanks, if you can't put fuel in them and provide ammunition. Um, and it's the whole sort of structure. And also very important is experience. Um, how experienced are your commanders, be your tank commanders or your army commanders, or even your politicians who are directing where this should come to. So when you put all that together, still the United States is without peer. However, um, the three big, the big three in this area, apart from the US, are Russia and now China. China steaming up on the rails uh, like some real thoroughbred horse uh, at a racetrack. And that is what one must focus on, I think that uh, when it comes to numbers, tanks, China and the US have pretty similar numbers. When it comes to manpower, uh, China probably has a few more, has a standing army of plus of two million. Mm. Uh, the US is slightly smaller than that and a lot of their forces in a sort of reserve force. So um, although at the moment, the US very much holds the Trump card and is the most powerful force in on the planet, uh, China, is investing strongly and looks to be trying to get at least parity with the US as quickly as possible. Mm. Hamish, if we get back to the kind of numbers, the nitty gritty of who has what, in terms of missiles and nukes and tanks, which country has the more impressive portfolio? Can we get into the numbers a little bit? Well, let's look at nukes to begin with, which really are the most important weapon that any country on the planet has. Now, in this area, the US far surpasses China. The US has probably around 5,000 nuclear warheads. Uh, China has a couple of hundred, although China is tripling its, its holding of, of nuclear weapons uh, in the next few years, but still, you know, pales into insignificance to what, what the US has. It is only Russia that has parity in this particular area. When we look at tanks, and you know, we, we don't want to look at every single bit of equipment, but, but tanks is, is a key thing because we're seeing it on the battlefield in, in Ukraine at the moment that tanks still are a very important measure of, of military capability. Both the US and China have about 5,000 tanks, but the US tanks are Abrams, uh, the most uh, uh, sophisticated and modern tanks on the battlefield where the Chinese tanks are pretty much old Soviet de designs um, and are, you know, 
20, 30, even 40 years old technology. So like for like, I would say that one US tank is probably worth four or five Chinese tanks. Similarly, when we look at aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, although China is catching up rapidly, still the sort of uh, lightning F-35Bs that the US has now and other NATO allies like the UK are far in advance of the majority of the Chinese fighters. So when it comes to sophistication, when it comes to things like nuclear weapons, uh, the US is still well in advance. But I mean, the key caveat about a nuclear weapon is that it's never to be used. That's that's yeah. its success. Um, it actually, you know, in a strange sort of way, it doesn't matter how many you have, nuclear weapons were there to prevent world war after the Second World War. And, and they have done that, mainly because there's parity between the US and Russia. Now, China is sort of been a developing nation, a developing threat. And the fact that it has nuclear weapons puts it on the top table, but they are absolutely no match. There would One could never envisage China starting a, a nuclear conflict with the US because China would very quickly be wiped out. What do you, if we get back to airspace, the, the commitment to control the airspace has become a, a big kind of topic, especially when we look at the Russia-Ukraine war, if you and I have spoken about. Who do you think has the better planes, the rocket, the scepters, everything? Is there this emphasis to control this area a little bit more? Yeah, air superiority is absolutely key in any sort of conflict. Uh, and we are seeing that in Ukraine. The fact that Russia has air superiority has really been keeping them in the fight there. So any nation um, is going to want to have air power, as we call it, which is a combination of aircraft, combination of space and everything else that goes with it. You know, they want the air power that is going to give them an advantage over the enemy. Now, at the moment, um, the US has the air power in advance, I would gauge, of the Chinese. Uh, the US has the space technology. It has the sophisticated fighters. It has the long range fighters. It has the complete gambit of capability. The other key thing about air power and airspace is air defense, which again, we're seeing is absolutely critical um, in Ukraine. And um, we're even seeing it in the Red Sea where uh, 10 missiles costing you know, half a million pounds, half a million dollars, have been used by the US and the UK to knock out drones that cost a couple of thousand dollars. So th this is another dynamic to it. And the whole drone dynamic is something, this is the unmanned aerial vehicles, is something that is coming to greater prominence. So in manned aircraft, fighter jets, at the moment, the US very much holds the sway and sophistication and capability. But when we look at drones, the US has a lot of very um, capable, sophisticated drones. What the Chinese are doing is, is turning drones into a sort of mass warfare by producing thousands, if not millions of them, which can then overwhelm uh, its opposition defences. So it'll be very interesting to see over the next few years whether the uh, approach that the UK and the US has for sophisticated manned aircraft against the sort of approach that it would appear Chinese are developing of having mass drones to replace in some effect um, manned aircraft, you know, if that holds prominence. But, but at the moment, I would judge that the US certainly uh, has the air power, has the air superiority uh, over China. Hamish, we know that the US spends more money on its military. Now, Biden allocated around $816 billion in 2023 from the budget, while China spent around $224 US billion. But what is China investing more in? Well, this, this is a very important metric. On the face of it, you'd say, well, the US is spending three times as much. Therefore, um, you know, it will hold the sway. But I think it's important to look at what China is spending on it. One other very key consideration here is a huge expense to defences around the world is manpower. In other words, how much you pay your men and women to fly your fighters and fight your tanks. 
I would expect that a US soldier or a British soldier is probably paid three or four times the amount that a Chinese soldier or 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 fighter pilot is paid. So so that is hugely significant. I think we we park that for a moment and then look at what people are spending money on. The US and its allies like the UK are spending a lot of money on sophisticated equipment, fighter jets, um, other types of aircraft, unmanned aircraft, missiles, uh, sophisticated missile technology like Storm Shadow and High Mars that have been so successful uh, in Ukraine a and on ships. Whereas the Chinese, the Chinese are spending a lot on ships, five new aircraft carriers, uh, which is a phenomenal capability. But they're also investing in in the sort of fourth dimension, as it were, the electronic space, cyberspace, um, in propaganda, in disinformation technology, and and that has a real quality uh, all of its own. If you can stop your enemy communicating then they can't use their sophisticated drones and missiles. And we're seeing this a little bit in, in Ukraine with Russia, what we call electronic warfare defense, where they can uh, intercept signals going to missiles to push them off course. This is the sort of area that we know that China is investing massively in. And when it comes to cyber, the cyber warfare, which is not only on the battlefield affecting your enemy's weapons, but is also getting into your enemy's computers and affecting that and affecting intelligence. This is where China is really leading the world. And um, I think it, it's uh, it, it's no secret that most of the cyber attacks on sort of government departments in this country, in the UK and the US emanate somewhere from China. So that is what they have a marginal advantage on. and. If all this sophisticated weaponry that the US has at the moment is to be effective in the future, then the US will have to, and I'm sure it is, spend on electronic defensive measures to be able to counter what the Chinese are doing in this space at the moment. Hamish, we did touch on this, but what, what do you think the comparison is when it comes to boots on the ground with the actual military personnel? How does the US stack up to China? Well, in pure numbers terms, there's not a huge difference. Uh, China has a slightly larger, what we call standing army. In other words, men and women who are in uniform, you know, 365 days a year, just plus of 2 million. I mean, this, that, that is a huge force. Um, whereas the US is, is, is slightly smaller, probably about one and a half million, and quite a few of those are reservists. However, this is not necessarily like for like. It's very important to look at the whole picture. Um, a US soldier is probably better trained, uh, more experienced, uh, better equipped, better aware of, of the world about them than their Chinese counterpart. Although these are the sort of sizes of armies that we saw in the First World War over 100 years ago, it would appear that that is still relevant, as are the tanks of the First World War the tanks today, mm. over 100 years later, are very little changed and doing the same sort of job. So it is a strange irony that um, I suppose, you know, there is nothing new. There's just stuff that we've forgotten. Well, it does seem to be this strange transition into the modern world, Hamish. But going along with what you were saying before and the way that China has found other ways to compete, whether it be through TikTok as that cyber security, you know, epidemic that we we're speaking about, or even the Belt and Road Initiative, which is obviously the huge infrastructure initiative that China does with 150 countries, or mass manufacturing and being at the heart of technology. Are these other ways that China is basically trying to infiltrate the Western countries? Well, absolutely. This, this is what we would call sort of to total immersant. Uh, it's not quite total war, um, it can lead to total war. Uh, and the, the Belt and Road programs that uh, that the Chinese have, particularly in, in Africa, are, are nothing really new. The, Brit the British Empire, when it expanded um, into India and into the Far East, was not different. Um, uh, the Chinese are building roads and infrastructure for poor countries in Africa. 
and uh, and would appear rather cynically now to be holding them to ransom and, and creating influence in that way. Now, that is not dissimilar what the British Empire did. It's not dissimilar what, what the US do as well. I think it, uh, you know, in, in the 21st century, it appears overtly cynical to, because most of these African countries can never pay China back. So they are then beholden to China. So its influence across the world through this is extraordinary. Um, you know, even to, you know, in countries like Australia, where, you know, certainly when I lived there in Melbourne, um, there were very few Chinese companies, but in my last visit, it would appear, you know, the, a lot of the real estate is actually owned by China. Mm. So their their influence in that sphere is is extraordinary. Their influence, their cyber influence or, on social media is also um, very comprehensive. China can influence everybody through TikTok or, um, or other uh, social media applications. But I think it's something that, you know, the West needs to look at very, very carefully. It mm. would be naive to think that the Belt and Road program, that TikTok and other things China is doing in cyberspace and on social media is not for the furtherance of China, rather than, as it would appear, um, the, the good of the planet, if you don't scratch too deeply. But Hamish, even with all this enormous influence that China has in so many areas across the globe, it's still categorised as a developing country. Is that not the most ironic, bizarre thing? Well, I think I think it is pretty ironic and bizarre, but but it's um, I think it's sort of symptomatic of you know how society has developed over the last twenty or so years. Um, we all live in a sort of uh, in in a bubble where we all communicate and the vast majority of the world communicate in English, which is why we here in the UK, uh, the US and Australia and elsewhere have really been in the vanguard of economic and social and political development. But you have got the most populous country in the world and English is not commonly sp spoken in China and Chinese people don't commonly speak English. So a lot of what has been happening in China has also almost been under that, that sort of language radar and understanding. But in the last 20 years, the Chinese economy ha has absolutely boomed and given the Chinese political elite and leaders the, um, the infrastructure the resources and the money to be able to develop. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what they've been doing. They've been developing their military to an extraordinary extent, as we've discussed, and they've been developing their influence around the world through the Belt and Road and other schemes at an alarming rate. And it is only in the last few years, I think that the US and the West have, have woken up to this to see that the potential threats that it might be, rather than just uh, political and economic development for the poorer countries in the world. Well, getting on that, Hamish, China has been accused of weaponizing fentanyl. We know that fentanyl has become one of the biggest epidemics, drug, drug epidemics in the United States. It's completely taking over. And there is this concern that it's been made in China and China have gone out of their way to ship it to Mexico where the drug cartels then bring it into the United States and it's become this war on drugs. What do you think about that speculation that this is China's plan, that they have done this on purpose? Well, it's, it's slightly outside um, my own area uh, of, of expertise. However, um, the, the facts are are relatively stark and relatively obvious. You know, the precursor chemicals for fentanyl are predominantly made in China and predominantly exported to South America where the fentanyl is produced and pushed in ever increasing numbers into the US. Uh, and only recently, US and Chinese governments have been discussing you know, how to restrict this trade. And it would appear that China, certainly on the face of it, is trying to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, is, is it possible that uh, this is malign influence from China? 
yeah, it is quite possible. Hamish, the US left $3 billion worth of military equipment in Afghanistan in September 2021. We remember that botched withdrawal and all the criticism that the Biden administration got for it. How much of a dent does that play into the overall military portfolio of the United States? You know, what does $3 billion actually get you? Well, it might, might sound strange to say it, but $3 million uh, and the equipment left in Afghanistan by the US military is is sort of a drop in the ocean. Um, I mean, the, the, the biggest um, disappointment with this is, of course, it's putting... Uh, put a lot of military hardware into the hands of the Taliban, mm. who are now suppressing that country uh, and and ruling it, you know, as a terror state. But as far as you know, is does it impact on the U.S.'s military capability overall? You know, very very little. It, even three billion dollars sounds, you know, a heck of a lot of money. But but even in these days where technology is so so very expensive. You know, three billion dollars wouldn't even get you an aircraft carrier these days. Um, you probably need twice that amount. Um, you know, it would get you a couple of hundred tanks, maybe, and it would get you, I don't know, 20 or 30 fighter jets. But um, yeah, in the great scheme of things, the worst thing about it is that um, you know, a terror organization like the Taliban now has some pretty good military hardware. Um, but it, it won't affect the overall sort of standing of the US military. Hamish, just finally, if a hypothetical situation does occur where China does invade Taiwan, how would the United States stack up in that fight against China if they were to go and help out? Well, I think I think that there are actually quite a few issues in that particular question. I think the first one is if China does invade Taiwan, what does the US uh, and uh, Taiwan's allies do about it? Um, one would hope uh, that learning the, the, the perhaps mistakes that we all made uh, that led to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, that uh, the US government will be very art clearly articulating uh, what would happen if, if China did do that. If hypothetically uh, China and the US came to blows it, I would say in the next year or few years, then the US is still very much more powerful than China. It would be hugely costly to both countries, but I, I am sure that Chinese leaders in Beijing realize that actually that they are not in a position to confront the US and I'm sure they wouldn't want to anyway. Uh, and of course, ultimately, uh, the US has a nuclear capability that vastly overmatches China. So I hypothetically the us still very much has the whip hand here but um the way that china is developing its military and other capabilities at a rate far faster than the us and its allies this is an area that needs to be reviewed and very closely looked at over the next couple of years hey mr Breton gordon thank you so much for your time today pleasure